one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about as well, you, you have been teaching a lot. And uh, you've done stuff at the Stan Winston School of Character Arts with Bill Bryan. One of my favorite is the plastic bag monsters. It's something that I think a lot of people can use. Now, the last time we talked, you kind of, we, we kind of, it was kind of something we were laughing about because it says there's so many people who are teaching now and so many people who are learning. Uh, but all of these people are not going to get careers as special effects artists. And yes, they're learning art and they can learn to appreciate art and it's always good to have artistic talent. But one of the things about these tutorials that you can find, whether through Stan Winston School or go getting video lessons or something like that, is people like me, I'm not specifically a special effects artist. I'm a writer director first in my own mind, and I want to produce and, and kind of branch out into producing and distribution. Um, I'm kind of, I want, I, I want to I consider myself the uh, future Roger Corman of Kyle, Texas. But what that does do for me is I'm no... Where, where is Kyle? Kyle's just outside of Austin. It's a... Uh, if you're heading down the 35 towards um, San Antonio, uh, it's about 25, 30 minutes out from Austin. Actually, with traffic now, it's an hour, but... So is that anywhere near Dripping Springs? Yeah. Yeah, I'm right by Dripping Springs. So... I've got a very good friend that lives there. I actually went up there for a couple of months to write to help us Dripping Springs. Well, I was I was not born in California. I was born in England, but I was raised in California, and I loved California. I was a Hollywood kid. I absolutely love it here in Texas. Um, we tried to move back for a year. wasn't working out. There's a lot more freedom here, like you were talking about. I'm away from all the Hollywood stuff, and I'm away from all the... <laughs> You know, you've, your script has to be, and and I work with, I still work with people who are in Los Angeles, so I still get the your script should be more formatted like this. Maybe you should in your third act you should do this, but I'm really out here to get away from that. And uh, the reason that I interview people like you or I um, engage in the tutorials is um, I can take household materials and I can take the green screen I built in my garage and my Black Magic Pocket Camera. We're not, we're just doing audio only, but you commented on how crisp and clear I look because I'm using my black magic, which is, I mean, even our cell phones these days are worlds better quality than the, you know, the old cameras that they were making Hollywood movies with. The resolution is better. The color is better, um, arguably. Um, but you know, now people like me, we don't need to specifically go and hire a special effects team. If we're smart, if we write our scripts well and not going for the big explosions or the huge set pieces we can yeah but even then after effects you can do any of this stuff i mean when i came up with it did you see the john landis film uh, innocent blood uh have i i don't think i have actually you gotta see it it's his answer to american werewolf he did a vampire mobster movie that stars don rickles and i got to deteriorate him as a vampire oh a bunch yes i have seen that one i why did i think it was, had a different name it's called innocent blood Innocent Blood, yeah. Yeah, Harry no, I do, I do remember that one. Um, a great story, yeah. The actress but, was very uh, attractive. <laughs> yeah, she was. Anne Perry, she's the girl from the original, uh, God, what was that show? She's an assassin. I can't remember right now. Anne Perry. But yeah, in any case, I developed and spent uh, tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars on contact lenses because John didn't want the vampires to have the typical fangs because how do you make that new? Mm-hmm. So oh, instead, he wanted to uh, do really, really interesting eyes for them. And I came up with contact lenses that would not only glow on their own, but change color at will. And it was huge. Everybody wanted me to patent it. Everybody was losing their minds after the movie came up. That, How the hell did you do that? We want you to do that in my movie. And I'm like, I'm not going to do this again. Yeah. That took me months, and I spent so much money. And I never did it again. But actually, I did do it on the stand with Mick Garris, the original stand. A good mix of friends. But, but see, the thing is, going back to what you're saying, now a 12 year old can do that on their iPad. Yep. You don't need a big Hollywood company to spend six months and $150,000 developing a certain effect because all you got to do is push a few buttons. And I know that's minimizing it, but in some ways it's not. Well, you know, and this is one of the things I'm a big, you know, I have my. My show, uh, The Practical People, which I think part of, I think that this is more of a household filmmaking episode, uh, which is my other show here on YouTube. But um, the thing is, is that I've, I've come to a point where I'm a big 
proponent of practical effects. I'll use them whenever I possibly can. I love miniatures, I love models. But I'm also learning Blender and I'm learning Deepfake where I can scan someone's face and I can superimpose it onto somebody else's face. Now they do that with celebrities. Now they're doing it to de-age people or um, you know, uh, they're blending it with animation or I'm blending it with animation. There's some stuff I'm doing that I'm I'm not too willing to talk about yet because I want to be the first to do it. These kind of ways I'm taking these programs and kind of using them in ways that other people that not the ways they're supposed to be used, but figuring out ways to kind of hack them into uh, other things. But I'm fully for the digital technology blended with the practical effects as long as I can do it on super low budgets. And people are going, hey, my micro budget film is $200,000. I'm like, yeah, my micro budget film is $15,000 and it's going to look great. Uh, with minimal cast, but you know, you yeah, you can take these programs and you can take these effects and you can blend them together and you can get whatever you want. You just have to know what you're capable of and you have to write it into your script in a way that it, the worst is when you you know a script is written and then you see how they shoot it and you go like, oh, they're they're trying to cheat something or they're trying to, you know, they're trying to do something that they really can't do, and so they're angling the camera this way or something like that. But if you write your script... Well, like the old ca car crash scene where you can't afford to see the car crash, so you hear the noise off camera. Yeah, stuff like that. And the audience is wise to that. But if you, um, you, know, if you kind of play to a style and you, and you play to what you have... Like I said, I, I fully expect to see people doing full paper mache movies where they're trying not even trying to hide it but because again video on demand we're going to see people be able to branch into different styles different ways of telling things i mean what um was it kevin mcturk is doing puppet theater short yeah. films and the well, maker movement had started years before the the covid crisis it yeah really but i think the covid crisis and and you know now these people have an advantage where before people kind of looked at it and went, well, you're low budget and we've got these resources and this money. Mm -hmm. Suddenly that's all dried up. Everything's stalled. And so these people are suddenly freed by the things that were viewed as constraints before. Um, at least that's my, that's my prediction. I, I, I do think we're going to see, like I said, entertainment evolving in all of these unexpected ways. And, um, like I said, you're going to see mini studios popping up all over the country um, that are really going to, I mean, not that they weren't before, but they're really going to take hold, I think. That's that's my prediction. Um, so so my next question is, you know, after the, uh, the documentary and the books, um, do you have it, your sights set on anything else or are you just kind of focusing in on the, the here and now? <laughs> I think like all of us, I'm focusing right now. And it's just, I wouldn't say it's hard to get through the days because I've always, you know, since I left Los Angeles in 2006, I've been working on my own anyway. You know, it's, it's rare for me, you know, I've, I've, I do movies occasionally and I, you know, I, I'll travel occasionally, never mind for teaching, but for, you know, I went down to South Africa with Ninja and Deantler, did their video. I just did a movie with, um, Robin Williams' daughter is Elda. She directed this film. It's really fun. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, I, I get projects that come in, but I'm very used to being sheltered in place anyway. So it's like, it's not that big a deal for me. The one thing I don't, because I don't even, you know, I know I've got this party animal reputation, sex, drugs, and special effects, but I don't go out that often anymore. Before the, uh, the lockdown, you know, about two or three times a month, see friends, have a nice meal, see a movie or something. And now that that one social thing I can't do anymore. But other than that, I'm pretty used to it. Hmm. And you're, you're, so, in, a, um, you're in an apartment right now, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah, in Sherman Oaks. Oh, okay. So I, I'm, one of the things I'm excited about is I, I'm, I'm more free to, it, yeah, bump on my microphone. Here in Texas, I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've got a garage so I can turn that into a mini studio and um, I'm getting to play around with all these different things. And I, I'm very much freed up at the moment, I guess, because I've been a homebody as well. The lockdown hasn't affected me that much. And most of my friends are in other states. So I communicate through Skype and uh, and telephone. And well, that's one of the other really interesting things about this. Sorry to interrupt, but no problem. The documentary we've been working on uh, since 
the directors and producers in New York, they have had in the past year and a half always had to fly out here. And uh, because of the COVID thing, you know, we had to take a break from filming because we don't want to ask celebrities or big directors to expose themselves to COVID. But we just finally, the, 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 the edited footage is looking so good, the producer said, let's just do it remotely. It's like, we'll, we'll film you at a location and I'll just be on Skype. Somebody else set up Skype then, so it worked with them. But but so the, the only difference, and I was very hesitant about that because the the producers and directors have got this, you know, rapport with, and some when we're on location, just like, okay, what's next? What are we going to talk about next? What do we do if we do it this way? What are, and uh, I just didn't think that could be done remotely. But oh my god, it worked great. It's like they were really there. It just their head was three inches tall instead of real size. They were really there, and it was no problem whatsoever. And I think. Society at large has been forced to realize that you don't ever have to leave your home, really. <laughs> You're building a house or something because there's so many things, even filmmaking, that can be done somewhat remotely. You know, you're right. I mean, I I just directed. I mean, and Charlie, Charlie's Angels, he never went there. They just heard him on the voice box on the phone, right? Yeah. And, and there's, man, there's a lot of things that I'm... Uh, it, well, I'll tell you this. I just directed a music video where I never saw anyone in person. The uh, the person had a, got a, a consumer, like a prosumer camera. Uh, the singer had a prosumer camera and a, and a green screen he ordered off of Amazon. And I just directed him. You know, he'd send takes. I'd have to give him advice on, you know, s- camera settings, which was, you know, and I didn't get to light the way I wanted but I did directed a whole music video where he was just sending me the footage and then I was just keying and doing the green screen and I was working with artist Val Merrick. Uh, he's, a, he's a comic artist, co-creator of Howard the Duck. So he was doing illustrations and I was animating those in After Effects. And, uh, and we, just, we just put the whole music video together in that. I am actually working on a, it may be a mini series, it may be a feature length, but it stars me, me, and me. Uh, as me as a character in makeup, uh, me as a character that I'll do different After Effects alien heads on, and me as, like you said, with Charlie from Charlie's Angel, me as voices coming through on radios giving this character like advice on things to do. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get away with that forever. Like you see people making like, somebody just made a Zoom horror movie about people who hold a seance over Zoom. Um, And I guess that works for that but i mean how many movies are you gonna get of people just talking online it works for documentaries and i think it works for little things where you know with green screen um i'm as far as covid goes you know my little garage set i can only get so many people in there and i'm also working with you know dogs barking birds tweeting kids going by with their basketballs and yelling and screaming so i can't do audio in there but what i can do is hire voiceover artists to pre-record i can storyboard and edit the audio and then i can actually just like they do with video games i can get other people to come in and lip sync against the green screen so the audio is pre-recorded like they do with animation or video games i'm sure there's some actors who are going to absolutely hate that but um you know just it's finding all these new ways of doing things and telling stories and getting around all of that. It, it, it's not just finding new ways of doing it. I think that horrible, horrible things for artists are actually inspiration. I really, really do. Like this whole COVID thing, there's been this huge construction project literally right next to my, my, my apartment. And uh, luckily it's calmed down for a while, but it's like we're, we're under lockdown, COVID's hit, and in the beginning, I would wake up, I'd read the New York Times, and I couldn't help from crying. In the beginning, when everything shifted, and it was just from everything I'd ever known to this like complete unknown, what is going to, what's happening in the world? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Thinking the liquor stores will be closed, I can't get a bottle of booze, I can't get a pack of cigarettes. Well, what's going to happen? to be riding in the streets, which there is now. So, I mean, I was so freaked out, and I think most of the nation and most of the world was in the beginning, and then we just got used to it. But, but during this period of time, I'm locked in my apartment, the world's falling apart, and there's this incessant telltale heart pounding coming from the roof, from next door. From, and I just started, I actually made notes and outlined this, this. I don't know if it would be a short story. I have a hard time keeping my, my stuff short. But it, 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 
you know, I mean, that how many of these movies are going to come out that have been inspired by this? I'll tell you another example. One a couple, few years back, this did end up in a book of mine. A few years back, I, I think I went out to see Lady Gaga and I got fucked up off my hands. And uh, I, the next morning I woke up with a fucking pounding hangover. I go into the restroom to take a piss, flush the toilet, and a volcano of shit and piss and tampons and blood and dead rat parts just erupted out of the toilet. And then the shower turns on and there's shit coming out of that. I run into the kitchen. Every faucet in the house was just pumping a, a sewer back up into the house. And sure. it's like, I've got the worst thing I've ever had in my life and now i got to deal with this. Well, that made it into a, a novel I wrote called the, called Mockingbird. It's kind of a... a it's kind of a ghost story that happens that, uh, that I wrote on the Gulf Coast in that still house. It's kind of a suicide ghost story. but And, and, and I know that's going to happen with us because I have a great idea for a very Edgar Allan Poe telltale heart story based on the lockdown. And you know a lot of shit like that's going to be born from this as well. Yeah. Uh, my, my thing you is I was inspired by this. I haven't seen any of them yet. I, you know, I'm expecting to see, I, I love metaphor, you know, in, in my storytelling. If I, if I want to tell a story about something, I can't just write about that thing. I have to almost as if I go like, I challenge myself. Okay, I want to tell a story about this, but I can't actually say it's that. I have to find a way to, to make it into something else. So, yeah. yeah. But you know what? I don't think any good writer does not do that. I think a lot of times it happens unconsciously, subconsciously. My thing about that is like you always need two layers. And if you've got three, even better, sometimes even four layers of meaning. So I, I think, you know, publishing is also going to change because of this. Now, you you have uh, you're fortunate enough to be working with publishers, but there's a lot of people who are self-publishing as well. I mean, you can self-publish through Amazon. So even if somebody doesn't pick up your story, you can always go, well, you know, screw you. I'm going to I'm going to put it out this way. And with crowdfunding, um, what I'm finding now, people are using crowdfunding instead of to finance the creation of their project. They're finding a way to create the project first, and then they use the crowdfunding to fulfill it. So the crowdfunding isn't so much like, hey, you know, give me money and I'll write this or I'll make this film. It's more of it's done. And now we want to do like the special printing hardcover of the book or the, you know, we're going to do the special DVD and, you know, you get the poster and the T-shirt and that sort of thing. Um it's kind of crowdfunding has kind of grown up that way where a lot of people were getting burned before with, you know, now it's like the opportunity is out there to say, hey, I published this book, you know, on Amazon, you can read it on your Kindle. And if it gets popular enough, suddenly that audience is there to crowdfund it and get it printed. Or, um, you know, I thought Alec did a great job with Harbinger Down. Um, and, uh, you know, he has his distribution deal, but in my mind, I'm going like, wow, if, if he gets the rights back to that, you know, he could do a special edition pressing of it because now people have had time to discover it on video on demand. So these, these ways that you can kind of step up your, um, your production, you can start small and grow it and grow it and grow it rather than just here it is, release it and hope for the best. Um, and, uh, and the audiences now are, you have more niche audiences and I'm finding, and, and tell me what you think of this. I, I think one of the, one of the reasons Hollywood is having such a problem at the moment, aside from the COVID stuff is they, they kind of tried to make movies that were so big and for everybody, they kind of ended up being for nobody. And I feel like there's money to be made for smaller productions. And just instead of saying like, Hey, we're going to, you know, we need to do this because we need to get the China market or whatever, you know, just say like, screw that. Who's the actual audience for it? And, and really kind of focus on them. And I think from there, like I said, that really will work up with that step up process. Um, and I'd imagine well, I one of the, one of the great things that's happened about streaming is that documentaries have become more in vogue than ever. And I think that's a great thing because documentaries for, for years, for decades, nobody would invest in a documentary because it didn't make any money. And now people are just going out and financing themselves and selling them to a great profit. And what's happening as a result is all the people, particularly in lockdown, you know, they're watching this stuff. They're, they're eating it like candy. Like I just watched a great series. I binged a great series last night called um, Connection. Connection. 
really, really well done. Let me just double check that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's called Connected. Connected. I, I That's on Netflix, it's isn't it? It's on Netflix, and it's really well done. It's not what you expect. It's very entertaining. And then I watched, I binged another one two nights ago. It was called Unwell. And you learn. You, you, you learn so much. And so, I mean, there's nothing bad about learning. And documentaries have become more popular than ever. And I don't think with the quality of documentaries they're putting out, if you take a look at Connected, that shit, the 48-minute episodes have got to cost $2 million each. I mean, they're, they're movies. They're, they're really so well done. A lot of travel, a lot of drone shots, a lot of graphics. Just really, really, really well done. So Even that I mean, stuff's that, getting more and more that. affordable, though. I mean, drone, drone, you know, people can get drones and, and uh, traveling is... Well, traveling is still expensive, but you know you you don't have to crew up to get the same quality as much as before. Um, and I, of course, I I am addicted to DVD special features, and I watch every special effects documentary I could get my hands on on Netflix or Amazon. So I'm looking forward to yours. And I just suddenly realized, like, you know, are people going to start saying that your documentary is like the Tiger King of special effects? Uh, is it going to be really outrageous? Are you? Uh, like, do you have a Carol Danvers? <laughs> there have been a lot of questions about it, uh, particularly with the investors. It's like, oh, my God, this guy, even the name of his book is Sex, Drugs, and Special Effects. Are we going to get Me Too'd when it comes out? <laughs> we we'll ruin our release. Uh, but no, I'm not really a Me Too guy. I mean, the only person I've ever Me Too'd is me. Uh, but yeah, there, there's there's the name of it is Rubberhead, Sex, Drugs, and Special Effects. It's it's it's. I'll give I'll tell you this. Give you this spoiler. There's no other effects artist on the planet, maybe the solar system, the galaxy, perhaps the universe, that would deprecate himself the way I do in this. The, the Ghostbusters scene alone. Right? I know we're not supposed to talk about Ghostbusters. <laughs> Lube up. It, we're it, talking about it's Slimer. So not, <laughs> not doable. For work <laughs> well i wouldn't want to spoil it anyway uh and like i said you you did make an appearance on the uh the movies that made us on netflix which i recommend to anybody well here's the thing too about you know like not just me too but you know you have the cancel cult this is something i talk about on my youtube channel as well people are going to come after you no matter what no matter how you try to appease them there is a certain demographic of people online right now who are what a lot of people refer to as the MMMs, mean, malicious, miserable people who wake up in the morning and go, what can I find today that displeases me and how can I use it to hurt somebody? And, and I think it's hysterically funny and I patently refuse to engage. This is why if you look at my face, I'm very, very active on Facebook and sometimes Instagram where they don't change all the fucking bullshit so i can post on it mm -hmm. but uh but i just i can't i can't I, I put up a pro kanye west post about four years ago i'm still getting <laughs> shit <for that. laughs> you know but the only reason i did it is people never because they, they they say oh steve's saying something uh, you know friendly about kanye west or positive about kanye west because it was a certain interview that i watched and i often watched the whole fucking 45 minutes and nobody else just saw the name kanye west and i was attacked and, you know, virtually canceled by all these people, which is just such a funny thing. Cancel the cancel culture cracks me up. If you go on YouTube, there's some very funny videos about this. Yeah. You it, know, well, one of the things I've learned about it is that, you know, the people, the only people that it truly destroys are the people who actually, you know, like get all like, oh, I'm sorry. I have to do an apology statement and that sort of thing, because that's when the, that's like the blood in the water for them. No, no, it is. And let me just tell you something. <clears throat> If you feel like you have to apologize for something, then you probably did do something wrong. I never apologize for anything because I don't do anything wrong. I'm just me. I, well, I'm so glad to hear you say that. And that is, like I said, with my own channel, I, I get attacked a lot for my opinions. Mainly it's like, oh, this guy's a narcissist and he's, he, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, you know, it's like, or I did a video where I a follow up to my other video where the first video I got told, you don't know what you're talking about. And then everything I said came true. So I did a video that said I was right. And they're like, you know, oh, look who's patting themselves on the back. And I'm like, you know what? 
yeah, I'm going to pat myself on the back. It's I'm not doing it to be like neener neener or anything like that. I'm just doing it to say like, look, I actually I made a prediction. It came true. What I have to say I is credible. I think, Chris, that you are a troublemaker because you are indeed the guy that got me in trouble with the estate <laughs> of H.R. Hey, I tried to drop it. I was like, well, we don't want to. You're like, no, no, but we should talk about <laughs> this. So, But I'll take full responsibility, but I'm not going to apologize. Because well, whoever picked it up, I mean, it went out to. There was that one sound bite that went all over the fucking world. I was not expecting I, that. I don't want to repeat that again because then the whole thing will just, you know. And I know I'm gonna. This this is where this interview is going to go south really quick. I'm gonna say it, and I'm not gonna apologize for it. I think that this whole uh, persecution of people without a judge and jury is absolute bullshit. And all anybody has to say is one thing, and you don't have to prove it. And someone's career is destroyed. Oh, amen, amen. And they I do it on purpose. Amen. They do it on purpose. The thing is, well, a lot of the investors are saying, well, Rubberhead, you know, look at Steve Johnson. He'll probably get me too. Then we'll, we'll, all our money will be gone. Nobody will release the film. And, and the fact is they do have a point. Not because I am someone that should be. Like I said, I've only ever me too myself. But all that has to happen because I'm basically wearing a target on my back because of my glamorization ultimately of sex, drugs, and special effects, rock and roll, whatever you want to call it. All somebody has to do that maybe I, I let go a week, you know, 20 years ago, I let them go a week before they thought they were going to be let go. They just raise their hand and say, well, you know, Steve did this inappropriate thing. That's all you got to do. And then, then, a, then a career is destroyed. Well, not only that, but I mean, people, you know, it's like back in the 90s. It, I, and by the way, I did not do that appropriate, inappropriate thing. I didn't. It was, it, I didn't do it. I was, to myself. I've done many inappropriate things to myself. <laughs> and you've written about them. Well, the, the thing, <laughs> you know, the thing is, hey, if you're going to do inappropriate things to yourself, you might as well capitalize on it. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, it's like, I, I was saying, good. I, I was saying to my wife, I'm like, you know, if I become big time, you know, it, it might just be an ex girl. I have disgruntled ex girlfriends, you know, it, it yeah, may be no, that, that exactly. they. It's not that I did anything that I shouldn't have. It's just that they, you know, all they have to do is take an event and spin it in a certain way. Uh, I know, but then you get the whole backlash to that. And they say, well, look, we've got all these innocent young people who have been abused or made to feel uncomfortable. Why would you not be on their side? I don't know. It, it is a really, actually, it's a really, really difficult conversation. Well, here's uh, the I'm thing. Just, a couple of friends go down recently and... Uh, it hurts my heart to see this happen with with no proof. But, you know, that doesn't mean it did. Did it happen? Did it not? Who knows? But there's been no due process, and suddenly lives are destroyed. Well, due process is, in my opinion, so important. And, yeah, you're right. People skip it. But, unfortunately, what we have is we have a situation where, and, yes, this is people who— Do you know that if you go to Ralph's grocery store, I'm going to have to lighten this up a little bit. Uh, they sell white rice— right next to brown rice and the white rice costs more why is that that's racist it should be <laughs> well, all white rice should be canceled hashtag cancel white rice <laughs> uh was it S systemic white rice is that a thing is, it sounds that actually sounds like a, a an agricultural all, right? it's not as good for you and secondly it costs more to process it why is it more expensive i don't know hmm. but cancel it <laughs> well one of the interesting things and this kind of goes to the cancel culture thing and i i always tell people to look out for this is you know it's like there was i won't name any names but there was somebody known for giving hugs in their studio very innocently but they had created a a, a very strong marketer Oh, I wasn't going to mention any names, but <laughs> it's out. That it's out. Really mind. Well, you know, it's like he got me too and then and he was out and the people that me too him took over and the quality of Pixar has never been the same. It's kind of like if you go like you ever see that this has happened to me at, uh, at parties before. There's someone playing a guitar, singing songs, and everyone's having a good time listening to this guy sing the songs. And then someone says, oh, I've been learning some guitar. Let, can I have a try? And so they go, okay, sure. And then suddenly they're painfully picking through chords, and everyone's waiting for them to get, and they keep going, oh, wait, no, that wasn't it. 
you know, and it's like, to me, it's like all the people who are playing the great songs have been ousted, and we're currently, everything's in the hands of the people who can't play but refuse to give up the guitar, and... Yeah, uh, we are going to get in so much trouble. We are, time. aren't we? Why I, is it every fucking time... You know what? I'm going to put a star on your name wherever I keep it and never <laughs> talk to you again because this is not going to go well. This is not going to go well. We basically were asking for it. We meet to ourselves it. is what happened. Is, uh, But no, okay, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is to me, this is important stuff, though, because like moving forward, and this is for the independent creators, and, you know... No, uh, can I interrupt you for one second? Just, 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 just to try to... to make what we've been talking about uh, the, some of the viewers that might be triggered by this. Yeah. Understand. Um, I am, um, I have changed my behavior enormously since all of this has become very much into, into public eye. Not, not that I ever raped people or made them feel uncomfortable. I certainly haven't done that, but you know, just the way I joke with people, the way I behave on set, I'm much, 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 much not the person I used to be, which was this freewheeling, crazy guy getting laughs. We all know comedy is anger's little brother, right? Right. Uh, but now I'm nervous and very aware. As a matter of fact, I did a Slipknot video in Vegas last Halloween. And uh, everybody was like really nervous because number one, it's Slipknot. Number two, we're in Vegas. Number three, we're in Halloween. Number four, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> As Bruno Mars sings, I'm a dangerous man with a little money in my pocket. But in any case, what we were meant to be doing on the show is to take all these gorgeous, gorgeous, really fun, really cool. I think there are nine of them, Vegas dancers. And uh, the, the, the music video is out. It's called Nero Forte uh, from Slipknot's most recent album. But the idea was, you know, we're, they're naked. And I've got to slime up their bodies and slip them in. And it took like four people to slip them into these like tighter than skin cocoons that you can see through. And they've got webbing on them and they're dancing with the, the Slipknot people. And so we had a big room full of nine naked women that were all slimed up. And we had to deal with like doctors, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had a meeting with my people and the producers had a meeting with me. And it was certainly during the Me Too thing. We all said, okay, you guys have to be. You have to be better than doctors. You don't even look at the girls. I'm like, how can we not look at them? We gotta, we gotta paint them, we gotta slam them up. We gotta, just, well, just be as cool as you can. And even the Slipknot people, uh, <laughs> they set up this production studio so that the band was not even anywhere near our room. So the band members couldn't see what we were doing, right? Or even walk in and say hi. And I'll tell you what happened. The girls, went all sex crazy on us because they were having so much fun. It was such a group, <laughs> great group of people that, you know, once I would, you know, paint their bodies and slime them up and slip this cocoon over them, I had to do, you know, a lot more stuff. I had to paint them with different colored slimes, which meant I was touching their bodies all over. And they fucking loved it and they were completely inappropriate and i feel like i should turn them in <laughs> the, girls, the girls were the inappropriate ones not the guys because we had all said no you can't this is just a thing you're a doctor you're getting we got to finish shooting this with no problems and the girls were just like living it up it's like and i've seen that i saw on the on the i, can't, I don't want to say names now but on on several projects i've worked on recently a lot of times the the girls that have really huge uh personalities will push the issue and and they'll they'll be very sexual and you're just going i can't say anything anymore I can't, <laughs> engage, I can't say anything and the girls do it on purpose they do it on purpose just to push the envelope but there's no blaming them for that but if i did one millionth of what the girls on a slipknot video or on a couple of these other films have done because you know it's always young sorority kids being killed when they're half naked i'd be crucified but the girls can do it. See, oh, I was trying to make this better, and we're making it worse. No, it's God, it's it's good God, to know. God, God, God. Okay, you know what? I might as well talk about HR Giga while we're at it. <laughs> hate mail. I'll probably have an armada come over here. A kid with an I AK. think at some point, peep, there's the next generation sees all this, and I think they're probably going to have had enough of it and are going to relax a little bit again. Because well, we, we said, well, earlier I said well, humans are, are, are social animals, but we're also sexual animals. And so, it, come on. 
Well, it, I, I'm only digging a deeper hole for myself. But, but okay, the, the, the point I was trying to make earlier is I've been a really good boy. I believe you. I'll, but the, I'll, girl, the girls have been testing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably see how nervous the guys are and are like, you know, let's, let's give them a hard time. Let's make... I know, it's fun for them. <laughs> and we're just shaking going, uh, don't do that. <laughs> I, you you know, know, that's, the next thing. that's the next thing. Ten years from now, the girls will be getting me too. Uh, and all the things we're doing that we, that all the guys forgot about that they did 40 years ago, the girls, they'll be 60 years old and they've forgotten, then they'll be fucking cancer. <laughs> we'll be that the guys will be using hashtag, can you do it again? <laughs> I'll actually... How right, much longer are we going to go here? Because I need to refresh my drink if we're going to go. We, we've been on the phone for over... You want to go another 15, 20? You want to go part three? We, we can do part three, yeah. If you want to freshen up, we can wait a moment. I'm going to tell you a, a, an H-E-B story that'll make you laugh and when we get going with part three. And, and we'll go for about, like you said, 10, 15 more minutes, and then I'll let you go. Right, well, sir, because I do have to get out of the house. I have a whole list of things to do. I so really appreciate your time, so thank you. Hey, I should be doing the uh, be sure to like, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, share this with everybody. Steve Johnson, Rubberhead Volume 1 and 2. By the way, the Volume 2, uh, if you haven't noticed, is a cover by oil painter Chet Czar. He actually uh, painted the cover of a, a creature burning the Hollywood sign down to the ground. So that might be appropriate for uh, the interview and my YouTube channel itself so uh check definitely check it out i gotta I got get that that'll be the thumbnail for this video